Hey everybody, this is PD from the Spinner Rack, and today I'm doing a video. It's one of my Marvel, the Marvelization of DC Comics. And this, to use an example, is taking a, now this is kind of a, um, a writer, artist, or artist writer, who did his first work for Marvel, but he was very much influenced by Steve Ditko, and um, Jack Kirby's Fourth World. So he would do his Doctor Strange sort of cosmic stuff with a character that, that was like DC's Dark Side. Now, Dark Side wasn't necessarily a, it was a Marvel type character because Kirby drew him, but his, well, I guess he was similar to Doctor Doom, but Doctor Doom, similar in a way where Doctor Doom didn't fight. Now, Jim Starlin who's kind of the fixer of Darkseid through his Thanos character, who was a character who worked, worshiped death, and Darkseid worshiped the anti-life, right? Decided to go to DC, to leave Marvel for a little while and work for DC, right? And he had his struggles on Legion of Superheroes, but he also did some DC Comics Presents, right? So in DC Comics Presents, this is kind of, the Marvel, the DC book, the Marvel book that DC did, right? Because this is a team-up book, like Marvel 2-in-1 thing, and um, what's the other one? Um, the, and, and Marvel team, yeah, and, and Marvel 2-in-1 thing. DC did have the world's finest, but that was kind of a different dynamic because they were friends in those books. Like Batman and Superman, even if they possibly forget a story in the 70s where they kind of fought, the initial things of those books were they were friends. So they would have maybe a Marvel cover, but ultimately Superman, Batman would get on Superman's back and they would fly somewhere together, right? So, and you can see even this is kind of a Kirby cover here where you'd have the larger villain with the heroes in his hand, that sort of thing, right? So, and then you have even the Marvel sort of cover here. We have John Jones being saying defeated by, by Superman here. So you have heroes fighting each other. There's some Marvel aspects already here, right? So I guess let's get into it. I'm already three minutes in, but I guess Jim Starlin wanted to do a different character than Dark Side. He, obviously, he wanted Dark Side, and I think I mentioned this to you before when I was talking about Cosmic Odyssey, where I believe it was this issue, one of these issues of Cosmic Odyssey, where um, it's John Jones and um, Green Lantern, and Green Lantern decides that. John Jones is useless, so he gets rid of him, and of course, that leads to the death of a planet. This is where that first story was done, right? So we're going to get into this now, and the the purpose of Mongol was a character who was stronger than Superman, right? And that's what he wanted, and you can see his other plan, besides having one character that was stronger than Superman, was to find out Superman's other weaknesses. And in this story, we'd see Superman come up against, well, he did five issues, not all consecutive, but five issues where Superman would be challenged in ways that would reveal his other weaknesses. Like, and ultimately, they would be kind of like character flaws, right? So the issue before this, issue 26, which is a costly book, I think I had it, but I think I might have sold it. So I can't find it in my collection, but um, that's a classic book. It has the first appearance of the Titans. That's um, Doc, um, DC Comics Presents 26. Superman goes up against a guy faking Green Lantern. And in that issue, Superman basically calls um, the power ring a trinket. So he's a little overconfident as this story starts up, right? So Superman meets 
Mongol in this kind of um, Marvel type of thing, right? Where you just have a circle. Like he appears like the Phantom Menace, but it's just like a circle. And that's how like Dr. Doom would appear in like Fantastic Four issue five. I think um, when Byrne repeated that, I think he got in trouble with the critics saying, oh, that should be something that should be more imaginative. But basically this is how in comics, how people talk from inner space. They project themselves in this little circle. He's talking about it and he's captured Superman's friends. Now, um, Steve Lombardi, <laughs> Lombard is not Superman's friend, but he's kind of in there in that group, right? So, Steve Lombard, yeah. So, um, he says, I want you to get me a key at the same time, right? And this kind of has kind of the Marvel banter here, too. Where Superman's kind of flippant and um, tells him that he has to find this thing. It's on New Mars. And but that's going to be guarded by John Jones, right? So Superman doesn't know what to do initially because he doesn't want to have to fight his buddy John Jones. But he says it'll be dangerous, extra extraordinary, extraordinarily tricky. But that's why I make, they call me Superman, right? If I can't pull it off, who can? So it's a little bit of a cocky attitude, right? So he comes to this barren planet of, I think it's New Mars, right? And who stops him? But John Jones, right? And John Jones says it's off limits. And Superman says, hey, he's gonna collect what he needs and leave, right? And he has to save his friends. But then John Jones presents to him that there's more at stake here, right? The lives of, of worlds beyond numbering depend on it remaining here, right? And that's what Superman's afraid of. So now we have a history lesson. Now this, don't be afraid. People dislike the info dumps, but this is adding grandeur to your story, right? So they talk about this race of beings called the War Zone. They were this warlike race. They make their own kind of Death Star. They pile it up with nuclear missiles on there, right? War World is created. And then of course they somehow, they mysteriously die, right? So the Largus, these guys decide to kind of preserve, excuse me, kind of preserve War World. They're not ready to destroy it, but they want to preserve it and they give the key to Jean, right? So they give this memorial, and he's there protected, and it's hinted that John defeated um, Mongo once, right? But then Superman, once again, I'm Superman, remember? Because it's cocky attitude. Because <laughs> he's a brash Kryptonian, right? So this is a little more of a Marvel take. The Superman being the number one guy, and accepted that he's the number one guy, it's just like, He's Superman, he could just take it and he'll figure it out. Like with his powers, he could um he could possibly save the people and stop Mogul at the same time, right? Save his friends. But um we'll see how that goes, right? So they have a fight. Since um Superman presents himself that he's gonna take it. Um John Jones goes and so he's gonna protect it, right? And Superman shows he's too powerful, right? Infinitely powerful, right? So, John is ready to protect it, right? And there's one kryptonite missile, right? But Superman uses his breath in the distance. He could stop kryptonite by using his powers, right? So he does that. But it allows John to get a, a shot in, right? And John, like, he has to fight him. And it's good, cool that he kind of went back to the classic face for John Jones. They kind of draw him like a, a bald white guy who's colored green. Superman takes him out, makes his weak, and puts fire around him. 
and then drops him, right? He apologizes, but he still needs a key. And he gets the key, and then, of course, with John taken out, all the defenses are gone, and um, Superman's plan is to try to figure out how to keep the key and save his friends. So they're at a standoff, right? He's trying to, but Superman cannot figure it out. But then Superman decides he can't give him the key. Huh? But we see his friends are freed. And Superman had nothing to do with it. But at the same time, Superman is felded by, um, by Mongol. Mongo gets the key. And John Jones stopped it once. Then Mongo gets away with the key. And then Superman says he failed, right? So he failed in this issue, similar to this issue, which I can't get out the plastic, but that John Stewart failed. And John Jones is upset with him about this, but he's gonna go back and get the key or try trying, right? But it's a big mistake by Superman by kind of being a little too brash, a little too overconfident, constantly saying, I'm Superman, I should be able to do this. So he enlists some help, this issue. Now, when he gets some help, I'm sorry guys, we're not reading the backup stories because we got a lot to do here. He gathers his um, super cousin to deal with War World, right? And I think they turn War World into like a wrestling thing in the post-crisis where in here, they kind of explain what happens that Superman was no match for Mongo. You know, after combat fatigue, he, he was able to t attack Superman and take the key, right? So now Superman is a little bossy and kind of um, telling Kara how to do things as, as the sort of leader, but Kara shows initiative, right? Superman's kind of can't figure it out, but she figures that satellite must have an exhaust and she uses her vision, microscopic vision to see the exhaust. And then Superman is like surprised, great Scott, is heading straight for the radar galaxy, right? And then see, she gets a little more confident and he kind of chastises her. Even though last issue, he just said three three or four times, I'm Superman, I can do anything, right? And he realized that War World is bigger than expected, right? They think it's passing in front of closer, but it's actually larger. It's larger than this, this, um, what's this, um, Dwarf Star, right? So now they're really impressed. And then they see this, they use a the telescopic vision, they find Mogul, right? They see where you control everything at. And this kind of information, I know people are scared of it. They call it info dumps. This is adding grandeur to your story. If you sit down, you see Alan Moore does it all the time. He adds a lot of bits in the dialogue. It's the same instance of how Matt adds a lot of information in here. I think um, EC Comics would do this. This is adding grandeur to your story. Do not shy away from it so it's just a page turner and you can get through it quickly, right? You want to slow things down, allow people to see the history of it and see the immense of how they realize how tough this is going to be. But then Uncle decides he's going to connect with it and he's going to be able to fight the Kryptonians, right? 
but then we get Mogul's history. So once again, we got the history, we got to see what was how the planet works, but now we get the history that the Mongol was kind of the ruler, and then this religious guy on this planet, one of his beings, kind of took power from him by getting inspiring the people, and they kind of take away his power, right? And he was ousted. This character's name. Archie Mandrake, right? So now, you know, it's the 80s, 1980s, a nuclear thing is big. So, of course, you do some more nuclear type weapons. So they come at, Superman's going to test, he tends to send his um, cousin away. Superman realizes, hey, this is not going to work. So he moves out the way before it detonates, but even the concussive power nearly, you know, killed them, right? So they realize this thing is too powerful. The Superman has a plan. If we, you know, attack it together, we'll be able to kind of, um, like, handle this, right? So Superman's going to divert it, and Kara's going to do something else, right? So War World is attacking. Superman is going in there. All of the defenses are going after Superman, right? And they realized something that was happening when people connected with the ship when it was attacked, this would cause a lot of people to have a cerebral hemorrhage. And that's what happened. Well, he just, he's too powerful to be killed by that, but he falls out, right? But still, the automatic defenses are there. So Superman's going to deal with that. And um, Kara goes far to build up speed, right? And she starts coming towards the planet at her top speed, right? I think past light speed itself, exceeding light speed. And she injures War World. And then Superman at that time is able to, while it's repairing itself, re divert all of its defenses and repairs to and onto itself and it destroys itself. And then Supergirl is gone, right? So this one isn't a bad one for Superman. He's a little stern with her, kind of under, underestimates her, but she ultimately saves the day, and Superman has to find out where she's at, right? So we go, it's going good, right? We're getting through this. Superman meets up with the Spectre. So, different from this one where they work together and Superman's a little stern, this one's more like this one, where we have to have a Marvel style fight, right? Superman is trying to figure out um, where Supergirl is. I have no idea. I think these are all pretty much Jim Starlin stories, but they DC at this point is feeling that he needs a scripter, so they go through the history. I know people hate flashbacks. So they give you a little history of what happened if you hadn't read the issues before, right? And how he was tricked. Then War World, they stop it. And then she's gone. So he's like, hey, she was going pretty fast. You know, I'll try to track her. Show some intelligence and whatnot. Figuring things out. But Superman decides he's going to break every barrier possible, right? Through time and space. Going faster than speed of light. Going through every barrier, right? But these, him breaking these barriers are kind of causing some repercussions. And Superman, once again, is showing that this is the character that doesn't use his head first. He uses his heart. Or, he, you know, sometimes he even thinks with his fist before he does this. And this is something you see in The Dark Knight, which I complained about when I talked about The Dark Knight, but it happened here beforehand. And Jim Starlin and Frank Miller were, were um, studio mates for a little while, right? Superman is breaking through all these barriers until he bursts through the barriers infinity, right? And once he gets there, because Supergirl, she's was flying past beyond speed of light. When she busts through War World, she kind of never stopped. So she's just going, but from sheer inertia, just flying, keeps going, but she's unconscious. Superman's planning on stopping her, but there's one more barrier that she that he can't pass and can 
The Spectre will not let him pass. Now, Superman has fought many beings, but he has no way to combat the Spectre. Right? So this is another, another thing. Jim Stalin is showing a character that Superman has no defense against. There's nothing he can do to stop him. There's no, no way that he can figure out how to stop the Spectre, right? The Superman's going as fast as he is, and the Spectre stops him, right? And Superman gets mad. He tells him to stop. He can't break any more barriers. And he's like, nope, I got to save my cousin. He's trying to talk to Superman, but Superman is not listening. He is thinking with his fist. So the first thing he does, punches him, does nothing. Absolutely nothing. So this is clear. See clearly, this is the Marvel approach of trying to show you the kind of adversaries that Superman would not be able to stop. Right. So then he stops Superman and he takes him to some other place. And he's like saying, "Hey, you've been going in time trying to save it, save um Krypton in the past, and you have failed." So it's kind of facing some of the things Superman had kind of done wrong. Right? So he's trying to save it, but of course it explodes. Then, of course, he's presented with Jonathan Kent passing. And this is done, This I think, times people complain about Superman talking about getting a sense of justice from the Kents. But here, it's right here. He says it. Even though he's a little, this is what I kind of dislike when you keep calling him his adopted father. He'd have to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he's an alien, that this was his adopted father, right? And he says, Jonathan Kent, the Earth man who adopted me, raised me as his son. He taught me honor, morality, and a sense of justice. So even here, where we, we can immediately see here, similar to what it said about Man of Steel, that every two seconds, um, he talks about the Kents. Actually, that's only in, I think, issue six of Man of Steel. Burned since the people were saying he was a person who was going to go back and cry to his um, parents. When he'd go back to his parents, he'd just go and eat and hang out with them. He never really talked over his problems with them. So, right. So here's the Grim Reaper. Superman tries to stop the Grim Reaper, and the Grim Reaper takes out. Jonathan Kent. There's nothing Superman can do with it, right? And then Superman even has to face his darker self. All his dark emotions, right? All of his aggression, right? Then Superman finally realized that he's been acting like a fool, right? And he's been thinking with his heart instead of his head. He had, and that's the thing, the, the character that would be, and what we've shown in the first issue here, that he would give up War World to save three people. He would allow a destructive thing loose just because, you know, this thing that Superman was no no use in a hostage situation. That basically, if you threaten like a grandmother, Superman would kind of give up, you know, the galaxy to save one person. Whereas, um, you know, with his powers, or thinking about it, he could probably figure a better way to do it, right? So that was what was in the first issue, All right? So then this story was done so Superman can interact with God. Knowing that Julie Schwartz would kind of reject it, he kind of gave him a plot that um, Julie Schwartz approved of. And then when he drew it, he added in God speaking to him, right? Saying he cannot break past this barrier. That was the point of the story that shows who someone Superman couldn't beat and for him to meet God, right? So they realize that all he has to do is ask and he gets Kara back, right? So we got through the first three issues and we've seen Superman go through a lot of stuff, right? So we're going to round out this story with the the last two issues and these ones are um let me get the full length novel no backup feature superman star versus mongol 
And this would show, this would be the all out battle between Superman and Mongo, right? So basically you get the history of Starman here. His sister has been killed and he's struggling with that. He has a slight costume change. He also has the staff and they're going through his history, right? His history of how he got his powers, how his sister was ruling, his friends that were there to help him. But then of course, he finds out him defeating the, the evil of the time, right? But then his friend had died. Then he finds out his sister was murdered, but he's not sure who the murderer was. So it's going to be someone he's going to avenge, right? So he goes back to his planet. See, this is, once again, a lot of information in a short amount of time just to show you the vastness of the story. Now, the mod, I think, what was it, um, when they, um, when Burnham would kind of do flashbacks in Man of Steel, what was it, Amazing Heroes would kind of call that bad writing, that, you know, not sort of doing it real time, which is basically, the writers are trying to add grandeur to a very simple story, right? find out that his girlfriend has been taken, right? This villain who destroyed his home, his, his new homeland has destroyed that and he has to find out who it is, right? We've already kind of told you. Starman meets up with this character that he thought was dead and this character kind of helps him in um, the finding of his girlfriend, right? So they have a kind of back and forth banter similar to Marvel, a little bit of aggression here. But um, he finally finds his girlfriend. He let out the beacon to get some help at the same time. But then we run into Mongo, right? And Starman is no match for him. He imprisons him, shrinks him, and imprisons him like he did Jimmy Olsen and Lois and um, Steve Lombard, right? So he's going to keep him forever, right? So he leaves. And at the same time, someone frees him, and that happens to be Superman. So Superman saw a beacon, and um, the that guy who had the beam sent out through the this guy here, this beam that was sent out, that was sent to Superman. Right? So he tells him what's going on. Another long piece tell you everything that happened. Gives you a nice base sort of saga into all of that, and they enlist help, right? And then Mongo has gotten the better of him, but Superman was like, this time, he's it's not going to happen. So, through all experiences that Superman had been through, Superman has a plan this time, right? He's going to act like he's super cocky, but he has a plan and what he's going to do. And we only get Starlin kind of he's into aching himself. So some shots were a little too dark, but right here it looks it looks gorgeous. Superman's acting cocky, but his it was only a bluff, so he could occupy him instead of allowing Mungle to destroy a um a um all these people like this this race. So this is another thing where he's kind of shed his cockiness and kind of getting to a place where he's more using his head. So this is kind of Superman moving through. So it's interesting that they kind of went through a thing where Superman kind of was shedding some of his cockiness of being the most powerful being. And this would be the story to kind of show you that Mongol is more powerful than Superman, right? So while Superman's occupying him, the doomsday device that uh, Mongol has set up is in the sun. And this is ultimately, Starman realizes this is why this was full destiny to be here at this moment, right? Without his powers, he wouldn't have been able to do this. So Superman is giving it to Mongol, but Mongol is surviving it, right? So Superman is just going to pound him some more. But Mongol is getting ready. To fight back, Superman gives him more, 
And then he surprised him. He hit him with everything. Didn't hold back at all. And he's still standing. Right? So Superman goes again. And Mongol is had it. And Mongol kind of steps on Superman. He said, the Kryptonian was a fool. He knew I was more powerful, yet he fought on. He should have known it was hopeless from the start. Right? And it read, reads, hopeless. <laughs> right? So he goes back. He's going to have his little diplomatic thing. And saying he's going to destroy the people. The guy says, nope. Ain't going to happen. And he tries it. And he's like, what? Whatever happened is gone. I can't. My doomsday device isn't working. And then all the planets that are here, they shuttle their way out. Right? So then his page is ultimately too dark. But it still looks cool. Superman and Starman are ready to take on him. But Mongol has decided, you know what? I don't want to even do this here. So Superman kind of felt it was a bully thing that the bully once con confronted would go back. But at the same time, Superman and Starman are no, in, in no way ready to take on Mongol, right? They are happy that he left. Superman gave him all he had and it didn't do anything to him, right? And this is after Superman had recovered after the beating he got, right? So Starman goes on to his thing, right? And Superman flies his way home, right? So we got through that. Superman is a changed man. He's a little less cocky. But this is still an arc to kind of show you what you know Superman's weaknesses are. And if you start here, you see the red sun, Superman helpless, and we have Hawk Woman fighting for her. Now this is a little involved more involved than um this starts you in a story where Superman is stuck somewhere dealing with a red sun. So it's showing you some of his other weaknesses. Here and I guess I'm gonna stop here, right? Because this is basically a story with, with Superman and um and Hawk Girl, and it's another space story. But Superman basically is kind of taken out and he has to be saved by her. So this cover kind of gives you that um you know Superman kind of needs help from these t guys from time to time. It's kind of changed from it was when the Justice League first came out and Superman finally joined. He was just one of the teammates. He was split up with whoever was on the team. They would work out their issues. Sometimes Superman would struggle like the rest of them. And in the end, they worked together and saved the day. And then there's this feeling among pros and fans that Superman is astronomically more powerful than all the other heroes. And he could basically do it all by himself. But through this arc by Jim Starlin, he was given kind of the... the um, Kind of the, the initially the Superman I kind of dislike, the Superman that's a little overconfident and cocky and gets his hat his um hat handed to him, similar to the Dark Knight. So this one he kind of worked him out of it, even though, and then showed hey he could, you know, lose kind of gracefully, right? And in the situation he's saved by um Hawk Woman, and he gets out of it. So I guess that's about it. You know, I went off for a decent amount of time. And um, check these books out. This is um, actually go get um, Dark Horse. What was that? So I keep on saying Dark Horse Presents. DC Comic Presents 26 through um, 29. And then there's two extra issues, 36 and 37. This series, at point for there's a Perez issue with OMAC, which has Superman kind of again starting out with his fists again. But... Um, you know, it's kind of the Marvel kind of team up where sometimes you get into a fight with the heroes and stuff like that. So it's kind of that Marvel fair. So even though I don't know if it was a big seller, but um, <laughs> I don't think it was. I have to look at the numbers of the sales again, but um, I think I saw them before. And I was, it's tough looking at the DC sales during this period because you look at the comparison to Marvel, it's just kind of like, good Lord. But um, yeah. Check these books out. Um, and I'm not saying marbleization as a bad thing, but um, this kind of overly cocky Superman 
isn't kind of the one I kind of like. But anyway, it's been a wreck out.